this is the Roaring Elephant podcast for the 27th of February 2018, a podcast about Apache Hadoop and the surrounding ecosystem for anyone working with or investigating big data and advanced analytics. My name is Dave and here is my co-host Jon. Hey Dave, another week on the podcast. Indeed. Are you ready for some Travodian action? Oh yes, we're going to do our best to do Welsh spelling and pronunciation in this episode. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. So, Travodian, which is uh, transaction in Welsh, um, is actually an Apache project. We've uh, we've talked about it on a, a previous news episode very briefly, and uh, we actually have some uh, some fine people from Esgin, which is the commercial entity providing support for Travodian. And uh, people involved in the project to come and talk to us. So yeah, we actually have three guests on on the podcast. So the three guests, Dave and me. That's a lot of people. So it's going to be a bit chaotic, but uh, push but a lot of fun. We'll make sure it works out fine. Indeed, and actually, <laughs> uh, this this episode went uh, went quite long, so we've split it into two. So you'll you'll hear uh, the uh, the guys from uh, Esgin come back uh, in a, a future episode to finish off their deep and technical session. Yeah. Now, before we go directly into the interview itself, you have a housekeeping message. I do indeed. We are indeed running the summit raffle for uh, tickets to the European Data Work Summit in Berlin. Uh, we've done this a couple of times before, so long-term listeners will be familiar. But just in case, if we've got any new people out there, if you want a free ticket to the DataWorks Summit that covers your entry, you'll still have to pay for your own accommodation and uh, transport, of course, uh, but a free ticket for entry, then what you can do is somehow promote the podcast. Now, the easiest way to do it is to probably uh, tweet uh, about the podcast, tweet about maybe uh, one of our episodes. We do have some some rules and some guidelines that uh, you can connect and see our Summit Raffle page, uh, and that'll give you some ideas about other things that you could also do. Yes, and as Dave said last time, don't delay, tweet today. Absolutely. My new catchphrase. <laughs> okay, and with that said, let's uh, start the interview with uh, Travodian. Enjoy. So today we uh, we have our first, at least I think it's our first, uh, recording where we have three guests joining us. Um, in this particular case, uh, we have uh, Rohit Jain, Ken Holt, and Ro Carla Mundi, which I've probably horribly butchered and I apologize in advance, um, all from Esgin, which is a new startup based around Apache Travodian. Um, so, first of all, welcome everybody. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So perhaps we'll we'll run through a few introductions first. Uh, maybe we'll we'll run through in order. Um, so perhaps Rohit, do you want to uh, introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. Um, so I'm Rohit Jain. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Esgen. And uh, Ken. Nice. Hello. Uh, so I'm Ken Holt. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Eskin, and uh, uh, some people also refer to me as the Chief Naming Officer, which we can uh, we can talk about a little later. If you wish. <laughs> I like the sound of that already. Okay. And uh, last but definitely not least, uh, Rao. Uh, I'm Rao Kakarlamudi. I'm um, uh, I'm one of the principal architects uh, at Eskin. I also had pre-sales team for Eskin. So if I understand correctly here, the whole company is down at the moment because you're all on the, po on the podcast. <laughs> the company <laughs> is a, a little larger than just the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, I mean, I, I first came across um, uh, Apache Travodian when I saw the, uh, the announcement that you just reached um, top-level project status. And, you know, I immediately thought, well, I haven't heard of Travodian before. So I went and started to uh, take a look at it. And uh, lo and behold, uh, a whole new world um, opened up. So perhaps you could, uh, Rohit, maybe you could start by um, talking a little bit about uh, Travodian, you know, where it came from and um, how long it's been around. Sure. 
So um, you might have heard of tandem computers. So these were fault tolerant computers uh, um, running on a massively parallel MPP platform. So we, we sort of are we started out there, and uh, we started with a product called Nonstop SQL in 1987. And uh, so that essentially is the heritage of um, of uh, of Trifolium. Uh, essentially, we we were in the OLTP market, transactional market. Uh, as as you know, tandem computers were um, used for those for that purpose. And then over time, uh, we actually introduced a more parallel engine called Nonstop SQL MX, and that actually is where uh, the code base comes from. And that SQL MX when also was used in later years uh, as an enterprise data warehouse. So we were, it went into the market and we competed against the likes of Teradata and so forth, even in the mm-hmm. enterprise data warehouse market. It was used internally by HP um, for its IT for a uh, very large enterprise data warehouse, which is still used, it still uses for it. And we took it from the nonstop infrastructure and essentially moved it over to a Linux-based infrastructure, and internally the project called, was called Sequest. So, um, so this is a product that essentially has seen, uh, you know, OLTP workloads and experience with that, and as well as BI and analytic workloads. It has about 120 some patents that we have uh, uh, gotten on this, uh, on this, on the on the code base, on on the technology that's in there. Uh, and that point, we in about 2014. Um, HP decided that we wanted to get into the open source market and uh, we wanted to leverage this uh, code base uh, and we figured that we would position it for uh, a transactional you know, uh, database in the open source area, uh, which would complement very well with <coughs> HP Vertica, which was, the, um, which was uh, really the targeting the analytics market. And so that's the positioning we had at that point. And so we introduced the code uh, at first, actually just as an Apache 2.0 license, and then eventually we uh, open sourced it uh, as part of Apache uh, in 2015. And um, so that's where uh, how Apache Trifolian uh, came into Great. being. So, I mean, Ken, um, obviously you're all from uh, Esgin. Um, so where, how does... How does Eskin um, fit into the uh, the world of Apache Trivodian? Yeah, um, I think the uh, the best way to describe that is uh, after HP had open sourced uh, Trivodian to uh, to the market, um, we we were then, if if you remember, at the time HP was going through a major uh, reorganization and splitting into uh, two different companies at the time, HP Inc. and HP Enterprise. And we were a, a small engineering team, uh, essentially looking looking for a home within one of those two companies. And uh, yeah. ultimately, it uh, it didn't quite work out. Um, and uh, along the way, we we proposed internally that, you know, this technology has been open sourced. This this team is still uh, intact, and and uh, we're ready to to basically spin out from HP and, and start up our own company and try and really uh, make Trifodian uh, successful. So it, uh, since HP was going through such major restructuring internally, um, we basically got executive approval to, to do exactly that. So um, we went out and found some funding to uh, start, up, start up the company. And uh, in July of 2015, we founded Eskin. So, um, Rohit and I and a couple other, a few other people were the co-founders, and um, we've been going for coming up on three years this summer. Fantastic! So it really was a sort of um, the, the the sort of project that everybody everybody dreams of, you know, an engineering team that uh, sees the uh, the real power of what they're doing, and you know, go, gets together and forms a company based on the belief. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this this team. I often joke that uh, that I feel like the new guy still. I mean, I've been with the team for twenty years, uh, and most <laughs> of the team. Uh, we we do have some some new players, obviously, uh, but most of the core team has been together for a very long time. So, we're a, you know a very tightly knit team. We know we know each other's foibles, and uh, we work together together very well. But absolutely, we we saw this uh, just tremendous opportunity to 
to uh, leverage um, uh, the amount of technology and IP that uh, that uh, HP released as part of the open source in Crifodian was really un unprecedented, I think, to, um, to, to do to do that. Uh, and so it was a wonderful opportunity for us. And it just happened to work out perfectly from an HP perspective. I think if HP had not been going through the transition it was going through, um, you know, we, we may not have had that opportunity. So it really was just a perfect, uh, perfect set of events that came together. So, yep. Yeah, yeah, sounds like it. So that's interesting, actually. You mentioned that uh, that a lot of the the core team have been together for a long time. So you know, when uh, when Rohit was Rohit was talking about the the evolution, uh, you know, all the way through nonstop SQL MX, Sequest, and you know everything else. Yeah, you know, really, the team's been together through pretty much that whole journey. Yes, uh, yes. Essentially, um, obviously, since we founded Eskin, we have hired some new people, pr uh, primarily course, yeah. in in sales and 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 things like that. But uh, the core engineering team has has worked on uh, several generations now of this technology. Um, and uh, as I said, many of many of the core team um, certainly have a, a longer tenure than than I do. I think Rohit. Uh, has maybe something like 35 years of experience. Um, uh, and so my 20, as I said, uh, makes me still feel like the new guy <laughs> on the block with, uh, with regards to that. I joined Tandem um, just just before Tandem got acquired by Compaq, um, but many of the team were you know, core members of the, the nonstop uh, Tandem group. Fantastic. So... First of all, um, you know, I'd like to give you congratulations on the uh, Apache Top Level project, um, the uh, the very event that uh, brought me to find out a bit more about you guys. Um, you know how has uh, how have things changed for you since you um, became an Apache governed project and um, started to uh, work within the the complete um, Apache uh, working process. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that uh, the, the the basic uh, essence of really getting into Apache and 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 uh, is really the process of, that that Apache follows, right? I mean, I think the 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 whole uh, Apache experience is about how, how do you uh, develop an open source and how do you release product and and in a, in a, you know essentially the philosophy of Apache and building the community. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, building the community is hard, uh, oftentimes, especially for a project coming in uh, with a large amount of code uh, starting out. But, uh, you know, it's a process that uh, you build upon and, and, and get community buy-in into the project. So I, I think that that process it, it really gets us into the right, um, you know, practices from a, from a development perspective, from an open source perspective. Uh, and I think that's what Apache has brought, brought us. And... And certainly in, in building the community and getting awareness uh, around with developers and so forth. And essentially to try and keep an excitement. Uh, about I, can I add to... Yeah, please do. Yeah, can I add? This is uh, Rao. I think <clears throat> what really helped uh, helped uh, in this uh, journey is if, uh, going back to the to HP and Tandem Dapes when you're building a database product. So you think about... Uh, developing all by yourself, right? You're not looking at the ecosystem. And now being part of uh, Apache Foundation, the first thing we always do uh, is to look at, okay, if you have a feature a customer is asking or a community is asking, instead of we thinking about, okay, okay, how can we do it? And we try to integrate, right? For example, like uh, when our, some of our customers asked, okay, we are looking for a streaming technology and then we want to, we have a, um, a interface where the data has to stream. So we went and then leveraged Kafka and then getting and then integrated to with, our, with, with the product. So the journey has become uh, simpler and also go, uh, getting to the market become quicker. That was a big change. And uh, as an engineer, you probably you know right. If you if somebody throws a problem at you, you want to first say, okay, I can solve it. Now, we, now the mindset has changed, saying that okay, is there something out there we can leverage and we can integrate? And then that's like a putting things together, right? That like if you have a pieces together, how do you put the pieces together? That's our uh, been experience last uh, two years. 
Definitely. Yeah, and I think that that, that well, add, you know, one aspect of that is the fact that if you were to actually try and partner with uh, some of the ecosystem providers, a lot of times their motivation is based on saying, well, how many, how much sales do you have before <laughs> I'm going to try and partner with you and do anything with you? Whereas in the open source space, we can easily uh, integrate with, you know, whether it's Janus Graph for Graph or whether it's uh, Solar for, for Search or, or HBase as we do and, and uh, Orc and Parquet and Spark and all the. So there's a very large ecosystem that we don't necessarily have to have um, to go to a you know proprietary vendor uh, to, to to get buy in into and, and I think that's a with, it's so. a great point that it should help to at least somewhat mitigate you know, a lot of organisations suffer from um, not invented here syndrome and I think you know the the op- open source generally and the Apache ecosystem especially I think is a really great way to try and mitigate some of that and provide people easy options to integrate into expand the toolbox you don't need to develop everything yourself there are sort of very widely used platforms available for many different aspects of what people are wanting to do on a regular basis so i think it's it's great to hear how you've embraced that and uh, and just you know, gone with it so yeah excellent um so some people that um, that maybe have have started to to hear about this and started to look at um, Trevodian maybe have the question um, you know why yet another SQL on Hadoop solution <laughs> now I know that uh, that's not where um, where Trevodian originally came from we've we've talked a little bit about the, the history of the project but you know that's very very firmly where it where it sits today so. Um, I know that it's uh, it's got somewhat of a different uh, value proposition to some of the um, more traditional SQL on Hadoop engines that people may be familiar with. But you know, what what made you think about actually um, you know going it with a completely separate project rather than you know as we were just talking about maybe contributing some of the code to an existing SQL on Hadoop engine or you know. What what was the what was the thought process around that? Well, actually, when when we started out uh, and and decided on this journey, there you know there were mm-hmm. players there were not that many players there um, at least in the space that we were trying to target, which is the operational OLTP space. In fact, I would argue that even today there is no solid uh, solution in that space other than Trafodian. So I think if you look at um, or you know OLTP and operational space, which is where Travodian is 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 really very strong. Um, I I don't think there is another uh, solution that uh, that that measures up in that space. Um, and you know we could talk about the competitive nature of it, but that that I think is the key key difference difference in here. Uh, it is it it you know we have we talked about well you could have you know maybe contributed to mm-hmm. Phoenix or or this or that or the other. But that would be essentially starting from scratch because you know we had already invested in this code base for you know 20 plus years with a lot of patents and a lot of capability, um, and it's all written in C++. So it's not something where you can take a code base and just merge it with an existing um, existing uh, you know project. We actually had conversations mm-hmm. with James Taylor of Phoenix, for instance, uh, very early uh, in in our discussions to see how we could collaborate. Um, but it, it just we, we we looked at it and we worked out and it, we decided that that's not possible because of the fact that they are pretty much Java based and we are um, we are pretty much C plus plus based so we, we we could not really do that so it, we did explore it but we ultimately decided that you know it has value on its own because of the capabilities it has built in we have built a distributed um, architecture for transactions which is very very integrated into H base. Uh, and very different from, say, Tefra or mm-hmm. some of the other implementations that are there, um, which which basically give it, you know, much more, yeah, much more higher performance and low overhead of transactions, et cetera. Uh, and, of course, there are many other capabilities like, you know, having large amount of SQL support, uh, syntax support from years of investment uh, and things of that kind. So, we, you know, you would have to essentially start from scratch, in, in essence, if we tried to do, 
otherwise. So we felt that this was a good start and hope, we were hoping that essentially um, we could leverage some other people and, and uh, uh, into the community yeah. uh, based yeah. on yeah. this. Uh, and that, and just uh, touching on Rohit's point, right? And uh, that is one of our challenges because of the code was uh, developed in C++ and C. And most of the open source community or most of the kids coming out of school, they're so used to Java, right? And uh, they're, they're, <laughs> where they're, maybe the tools are so much tools are available. And that has been some of the challenges we fa- we are currently facing where because our core SQL engine is all based on C++. When somebody has to come and contribute, they look at it and they're willing to contribute surrounding code. But when you look at the core, we don't see much, right? And that's where we go and then try to train people. We try to go and then um, and then say, okay, maybe you can le- you can contribute an optimizer side or a trans- distributed transaction side. But we have not done. Maybe we need to do a lot more a training so that we can find some of the people who can contribute to the core engine. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. You're right. The the uh, the Hadoop ecosystem, for for better or worse, does seem to be uh, very Java focused. And uh, you can you can make lots of comments about uh, memory usage and things like that. But it's just it's just the way it is. But it's it's interesting to see that. You know, you've you've gone you know gone a different route given the the history of your code base and stuck with it, and still there's a, you've still got great integration with many of the uh, the core elements of a, a typical Hadoop environment. Dave, so, could, if I could just add, yeah, go uh, ahead to what Rohit and Rao, Rao said. Um, I think an important aspect about you know you, you say why why another SQL engine on Hadoop. I, I think. Um, one of the points that we would argue is that uh, it, building a, a world-class kind of enterprise-grade uh, SQL engine is a is a non-trivial undertaking. You you can't build that uh, overnight or in a few months or even a year or two. It, it takes you know decades. Uh, if you look at the investment that companies like Oracle and IBM and all of these other companies have put into into their products to make them as capable as they are today, and and so I'm. Um, uh, the uh, the code base that uh, you know was contributed to Apache with with Trifodian is essentially a you know a world class uh, database engine that's had uh, you know years of investment hundreds of millions of dollars uh, that have gone into it over the years and so we took a, a different approach to many open source projects where they've essentially built um, a new SQL engine from the ground up often they started with a storage engine and then built the SQL on top or maybe used mm-hmm. An existing Apache project like Apache Derby, for example, um, we, we took the opposite approach. We took our world-class uh, uh, kind of uh, query engine and married that with available storage engines, uh, initially HBase uh, that was available in uh, on Hadoop. So it's a it's a different approach to the to the problem as well. Um, you know, we we leveraged what we had, which we we thought was uh, was. Uh, you know, incredible code base, a lot of IP, um, world-class kind of optimizer and things like that, and married that with the best of what was available on Hadoop at the time. So it's a, it's a, I would say it's a different approach to a SQL engine on Hadoop than many of the other offerings that are out there as well. Okay, okay. That, that makes makes sense. So yeah. just to add to Ken's point, I, we we did one once an exercise to see how many engineering years of effort has been went into. I think it was close <laughs> to thousand years of database uh, product development experience has been went into this product. Yeah, that's not something you want to throw away with the baby with the bathwater on. Right. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So. Um, one of the uh, one of the areas that um, that you mentioned is that sort of initially HBase was a lot of the focus for the underlying um, storage engine. So from having a look at, uh, at sort of some of the uh, some of the blog posts and a few other things, I now see that you know you've got support for um, Orc for the underlying uh, a different underlying storage engine and Hive. Um, are there other storage engines that you also support? Yeah, so essentially when we first started out, uh, the, the choices were really from a low latency storage engine perspective, 
something that give you a key cluster um, approach, which we needed for uh, transactional workloads and so forth, was really between Cassandra and HBase, right? So we, we chose HBase because of the ecosystem. Essentially, we felt that the Hadoop ecosystem was uh, it would provide uh, a lot of capability in the long run. Um, and also, I think that Im almost immediately we had to integrate with Hive tables. So we don't necessarily integrate with Hive. Uh, what we're really uh, accessing is Hive uh, formatted tables in HDFS directly, right? So you can make that an external table and access it. So, so that support was there right off the bat within mm -hmm. uh, Travodian itself. Now, um, since then, of course, what we have done with Eskin DB, uh, which is really the commercial part of uh, uh, of, of uh, Travodian. Now, just to just to give you a little uh, difference of what what Eskin DB provides over um, over Travodian is essentially it provides a database manager, right, um, so that you can manage your mm -hmm production infrastructure. Uh, it provides things like um, multi-data center support with, uh, with, with you know, um, full distributed uh, updates as well as multi-master type updates. So you can, you can have uh, two data centers where the writes are happening and being replicated to the back end on the other, uh, other side. We have uh, an appointed time recovery and, and all the kinds of things that you expect for an enterprise class mission critical database. So you you wouldn't find all that in, in any other operational mm -hmm. solution on, on Hadoop. So so that we had already built upon and built uh, out uh, as part of Eskin, Eskin DB. But then what we also found was, of course, our customers really, while operational is, a, is, a, is an, an opportunity, really a lot of folks wanted to do analytics and, and all that. And of course, we had the capability to do that. We had uh, we we had done enterprise data warehouses and it still runs HP's enterprise data warehouse. So we we had the capability. That the only reason why we hadn't you know, explored that initially was because of HP Vertica. We we didn't want to compete with them. So then we did expand into uh, supporting Apache Orc for BI analytics workloads, and now um, we support uh, Avro uh, as well as well as. Um, um, as well as Parquet. So because, of course, you know, there's a lot of Cloudera customers, mm -hmm. so um, Parquet becomes important. So those are the those are storage engines that we, we support today um, as, as we expanded to. So and that's to okay. answer your just question. Just uh, to add to Rohit's points, I just want to say, from the get-go, uh, because I worked on this uh, stack from all the way from storage engine to to the connectors. If you look from the get-go, the way this uh, this engine has been architected is like you can say the three-layer architecture where you have, if you are going from uh, um, uh, bottom up, you have a storage layer. We used to own our own storage layer. And then we have a SQL layer where you have um, optimizer, runtime engine, uh, distributed transaction manager, workload manager. Then you have a client layer where you come in ODBC, JDBC, .NET, Hibernate, those kind of. So from that perspective, what we have done is, because this is a three-layer architecture, all we have done is replaced our own proprietary storage engine and attached to any other storage engine. For example, we picked HPace to, to support transactions. And then mm -hmm. we could, could have easily expanded. For example, we added Arc and then Parquet, and then it could be anything else, right? So that's where, but from the code perspective, the top two yeah, the top two layers are still same. They didn't change. Mm -hmm. It came from last 20 years, proven technology. The only thing changed in the bottom layer. Got it, got it. So obviously your you know, Travodian is very focused um, around the the OLTP world. Uh, I know your the website mentions you know, web scale SQL on Hadoop. Um, and so obviously scalability and performance uh, are sort of two of the key um, elements that Travodian is really focused on. Um, now obviously the the main the mainstays in the OLTP space are people like Oracle and, and Teradata. So how do you go up against the uh, you know, the behemoths in this industry? Um, and you know what sort of uh, what sort of customers are looking for? Um, you know, a migration to something like Travodian. 
Yeah, because uh, let, let me call some of the use cases uh, where mm -hmm. where, where um, we are shining, right? Um, we if you look at uh, one of the interesting uh, thing we found out in this journey was when we were part of HP and uh, some of the uh, HP has this uh, discovered every year so that we can go and then showcase the new new products coming onto the market. And then we were we we, we had a, we had our own booth, and then Travodian was uh, being displayed. So one of our CTO of HP China was visiting, and then he was visiting and said like, "Oh, really? You guys can do this? Okay, I have two uh, use cases for you. Can we um, uh, do a POC with these two customers?" So this was very interesting. Was um, one customer was a telco customer, another was an IoT customer, where. The IoT customer, a lot of data. It says a public transportation a system where the data is being generated from the buses, and then they want to monitor, okay, the information about the bus and the driver and the passengers getting and getting out, and also at the same time they have operators monitoring this uh, the route so that they can real time make uh, adjustments, and also wanted to keep this data for a longer to do some deep analytics. So that was one use case. And then mm -hmm. where they were looking for, interesting thing was they were looking for a lot of rapid ingestion. And at the same time, they were do, looking for real-time reporting, which is what we we were we are really good at. Because if you look at, because that's our heritage where we came from Tandem, where as the data is coming in, and then we can also start, try to do uh, near real-time reporting. And they were also want to keep this data for a longer so that they can do some, um, understand the pattern so they can adjust the bus routes accordingly. And that was use case. And then we have done this journey. And then again, they were comparing us from, you know, from the oracles uh, um, and uh, with us. But the real, if you look at from the ingestions perspective, like um, it was not in millions, but it was in thousands. And then another thing they were seeing was because they were looking for a scale-out architecture, and then this engine can scale because of the MPP nature capabilities, it was able to scale out pretty well. And then which was, and we were able to um, <clears throat> solve all the SLS, they were looking at it, and then it was successful there. And also one of the things, uh, the other use case, Telco, which was mainly from, they already had uh, uh, made this journey of investment into uh, into Hadoop and HBase, where they were looking at a monthly billing cycles. This is the Telco. And they were looking for a SQL engine, which fits really well on HBase with a update capabilities, right? So then they looked at us and then say, okay, this engine fits well, and then why don't we do this uh, journey? And the both POCs were successful. And that's why the our customers, um, our journey with customers in China has started way ahead of US. Before, by the time we came out and started, we already have a couple of customers in China. And uh, from the from that perspective, then we looked at it, and then more and more customers, were, when we looked at it, and then we were fitting more into this IoT kind of use cases where they were looking for um, um, ingestion and reporting at the same time. And also, as Rohit pointed out, uh, one of the one of our customers in U.S., Webroot, Webroot is a is a security enterprise company where they they collect a lot of click, click stream data, and all this mm -hmm. click stream data go into into S3 in Amazon, and then our platform runs both in cloud as well as on prem. In their case, it runs in AWS, and they, as the data is been ingested, comes into our box. And they were looking at the same as the data comes in, they do look at real time. They have a dashboard where they're running a lot of um, queries and then they want to check, okay, who is doing where and then that kind of analysis. And they keep this data for 13 months. And uh, it's all done within our SQL engine on HBase. And then now they are thinking of expanding this data to five years so that they can do some deep analytics and data mining. And that's the time we thought of, okay, bringing in a columnar format so that they can do some deep analytics. So what we have done in this journey is, as we learn from customers and we bring in the hot data, you can call it as hot data in HBase because we provide you transaction sub capabilities. And as your data is becoming warmer to colder, we move transparently that data into columnar format of our 
or parquet based mm-hmm. on the customer needs, then you can do your deep analytics. And then you can take that, whatever you uh, um, learn on that and apply the patterns on the real time. And that that um, um, closes the whole loop. And this is a customer which is very successful. And then they are in production from last uh, uh, two years. And uh, we also have uh, an, um, uh, another customer, which is a storage uh, um, a company, one of the biggest storage companies. They had done a journey with uh, Cassandra and Elasticsearch, and they were looking for a, a, a SQL engine to cut down their cost because they were looking at a lot of operation cost in the ELT. And then because they have to move the data from Cassandra to Elasticsearch for reporting, they were looking for one engine where they can do this mixed workload. And then they have done this journey with us. And then that is another um, uh, use case where the data was coming in and then they wanted to do the reporting and then they were successful. And then we have many uh, in different verticals, for example, in finance, because again, in finance, because of tandem heritage, and then people know us in the in finance world because of transaction capabilities. And then we have customers in the finance also. Perfect. And Rao, so, Rao if I could just add one more one more thing, um, you, you, uh, Dave. I think you specifically were asking about you know uh, going sort of up against the likes of, of Oracle. Um, Oracle yes. And and we don't. Yeah, we don't explicitly um, target you know our existing Oracle customers today, but but. Uh, Customers, when they're when they're running up against um, expansion problems, when they're really starting mm-hmm. to deal with big data, they find that you know expanding their Oracle systems today might just be very expensive, and so they start to look for alternatives for for any new uh, new workloads or greenfield applications that they might be trying to deploy. Rather than deploy it on their existing Oracle systems, they might look for an alternative. And um, we had a use case in China. China is a, a market where big data, yeah. I think, really is, um, you know, it's a reality. Just just with the scale of the population and the things that they're doing there, it, yeah. it's uh, big data is, is a reality there more than it is in other places. I think in other places it's often talked about, but it's, uh, you know, when you look at the actual numbers, it's not really big data. Um, but we we went head to head with uh, with Oracle for a, a use case in in China, um, and they were it was an IoT type application where they were looking for a sustained ingestion rate um, that you know would just uh, continue twenty four by seven no no end in sight, um, and on that comparison um, just just to sort of boil it down to the bottom line, uh, the end result came out as uh, uh, we came out with a five times better price performance on that workload uh, compared to Oracle. And I think earlier on in the analysis, they were also looking at IBM DB2. Um, so so Trafodian, you know, really kind of proved itself uh, on, a, on a big data scale out scenario um, for, for a customer who, who was looking at trying to deploy a new workload and their existing systems uh, just were already at capacity. And so they had to either expand them or try something new. So, Okay, so it's very much sort of focused on organizations that are really getting to true big data scale, but still like and want the benefits of all of the traditional OLTP, you know, goodness that they're used to. Correct. One of the advantages, right, because of the heritage, right, it's a complete ANSI SQL engine with a pretty much standard ANSI SQL and then which is standard ODBC, JDBC interfaces. So if you have existing applications which are built uh, on PostgreSQL or SQL Server, which has ANSI SQL, or in case of an Oracle, if they're also Teradata, right, you should be able to move them pretty easily as long as they're not um, uh, written for like PL SQL. We do have conversion mm-hmm. tools, but most of the engines which are written in ANSI should be able to migrate pretty easily. Okay. Okay. So it was interesting you mentioned that you know the Chinese market was quite uh, quite strong for you, and in fact, you know, started up um, quite ahead of um, some of the other regions. I noticed that if you look at looking at the sort of contributors list, you've got you know quite a lot of um, you know Chinese members as part of the community. So it's, it's obviously um, you know, it's really taken off um, over there. 
are you seeing you know are you seeing sort of that following through now into into other markets or are they still significantly ahead in uh, in China I think um, I think they're significantly ahead on on the on the big data uh, side of things um, mm-hmm. just just you know sheer sheer numbers uh, make that kind of a reality um, that's not to say that we're Customers here in the U.S. in particular are uh, looking to. Um, so I think today big data is a reality in China, and in in the U.S. people are or customers are starting to see that this this is their future, and they need to you know uh, be putting systems in place that can really scale out to handle the kind of uh, um, data that they're looking at in the future. So it, it, you know I th- I think that um, from from our experience at least. Um, it's it's definitely a much more pressing issue for customers in in China than it is mm-hmm. elsewhere. Um, some some customers, you know, as I said earlier, think they're dealing with big data, and you know, it might be bigger than what they're used to, but it's not it's not really uh, a big data problem. Um, and so, it, but that, having said that, it also depends on uh, you know how how they think about their use cases. I mean, all all you have to do is decide to keep data instead of data that you might have been keeping around for three months or six months to now think about keeping that for five years maybe. So you can really yeah, do some yeah. some very deep analytics on that. That changes the paradigm yeah. uh, right away. So it depends on how they're thinking about the problem. Yeah, very much so. I mean, we're, we're seeing increased, things like increased regulatory compliance all over the place is requiring people to start thinking about how they can keep that data for far longer than they ever thought about with their previous architectures. Yes, yes, I agree. Yes, yes, yeah. And then also what we felt was uh, um, in some of the use cases where in, in, China, in, in, in Chinese market, they're trying to um, at least play with it we, because we hear more, more and more use cases here where we not only we are seeing use cases, they're also are interested in doing the journey and doing a POC. If uh, one example which was very interesting, there was this is a province where the it's a toll gate system where the uh, as mm-hmm. your cars are passing by, right? And and in in China looks like uh, if you are in a province, the cars the, the cars are not supposed to go outside of a province, and then and because when you buy you're buying your license based on the province, right? So they have to keep track of who is who is going where. So they have like, a, uh, like let's say they have hundreds of uh, toll gates in, in the provinces where you have um, uh, a cameras capturing the license plate and then and the driver uh, face, right? Where So within the 20 seconds where you cross the toll gate, they want to capture this information. And then in their in the huge database, it's like you're talking about uh, millions of people, right? It's a database. And then they want to Mm -hmm. make sure that uh, it's a valid license plate. And uh, and within that 20 seconds, right, that's the real big data where they're really looking at not only capturing data in the background, you are doing a deep analytics to understand the pattern recognitions of images to make sure, okay, the 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 vehicles uh, crossing this gate have a valid uh, um, or valid or not. So that's where we are seeing when we look at it uh, from those use cases. Yes, we and then then they look at our technology, and then looking at our performance and and then scale out capabilities, we are able to um, meet their SLAs. So that's the first half of the uh, the interview. Lots of great stuff already and lots more great stuff to come. So thanks very much for the uh, the Esgin folks and talking to us so far about Travodian. Yes, and uh, you might have noticed that I wasn't talking a lot during the interview, but that's because I've yet again upgraded my recording equipment and I had to put in, uh, take an eye and uh, make sure that that all works on the technical side. But uh, I promise you'll hear, hear more of my annoying questions in the second part, which should come out in two weeks' time, because next week will be a news episode, of course. Indeed. And with that, that's all the time we have for today. We hope you enjoyed this serving of Trevogian Bite Size Big Data. We'll be back next week with a new episode. Until then, go to www.roaringalpha.org where you can find more information, including a feedback form. You can also follow us on Twitter using the at Hadoopcast tag, and you can contact us by email to podcast at roaringalpha.org. Send us any thoughts, comments, criticisms, and any other feedback you might have. Until next time, my name is John. And my name is Dave. And we look forward to talking to you next week. 
See you then. 